Monday, and that so happens to be the day that I like to talk about monsters. Hello, and welcome to Monster Mondays. I'm Jeff Arbuckle, co-host of the podcast Film Seizure, that you can catch at filmseizure.com or at a number of podcast providers online. Now we're at the literal doorstep of the 200th episode of Monster Mondays, and I thought I'd close out this month of silent spooks with back-to-back films made by the brilliant German filmmaker F.W. Murnau. Now, Murnau made a total of 21 films between 1919 and 1931. Now, while a majority of his films he made are still preserved, it would ultimately be three of his movies he would probably be best known for for two film buffs. Next week we'll talk about the one that he is by far best known for, but the other two uh, would be his first American production, Sunrise, A Song of Two Humans, and this week's feature movie, his final German film, Faust. Now before we talk about Faust, let's talk a little bit more about Murnau. F.W. Murnau is probably among the best remembered and best known of the German silent filmmakers. I'd say he and Fritz Lang have the advantage of the being the two that film study folks uh, still focus quite a bit on. But prior to getting into film, Murnau served in the German army during World War I. But before the war, he was actually born Friedrich Wilhelm Plump. Uh, he would later take on the pseudonym Murnau because that was a town he lived in and that's located in the very southern part of Bavaria in Germany. Now, Murnau was fascinated in a lot of artistic things. He originally studied philology, which is the study of written and oral language and historical study. Now, I had never heard of that before, but basically it's the intersection of textual criticism, literary criticism, history, and linguistics. He was heavily influenced by people like Nietzsche and Shakespeare and other Northern European philosophers and playwrights. So that whole philology thing starts to make a little bit more sense there. But later, Murnau would study art history and literature. There, director Max Reinhardt uh, took notice of Murnau and invited him to the actor school. And after the war, he returned to Germany to set up his own film studio with his friend Conrad Veidt. Now, Veidt, we know him pretty well. He was Caesar in the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. But even more popular, uh, pop culturally relevant, well, Veidt played the man who laughs in 1928 and is widely claimed to be the inspiration for the comic book icon the joker's appearance but i digress uh i have more to say about murnau next week but before we talk about faust murnau was a gay man his lover a german poet also served in world war one but was killed in 1914 and this was said to have an incredible impact on murnau where he would use a lot of themes of incredible loss sacrifice and just the terrible violence of war in his films It was uh, this man that Murnau was in love with that introduced him to Expressionism, which, of course, would be where he would dabble to great effect in his filmmaking career. As for the subject of this final German film for Murnau, let's talk about the classic German folktale of Faust. Now, interestingly, while I have a general concept that Faust deals with a version of Mephistopheles, uh, known in this movie as Mephisto, uh, there are two things that are most definitely tied to me on a personal level. First, Mephisto is the name borrowed from Faust for a popular demonic character in Marvel Comics. Second, every year for my birthday, my dad and I go to the restaurant in Indianapolis known as the Rathskeller. Uh, This is a fairly significant place in India as it served historically as kind of a central German club for the vast number of German folks who are descendant from settlers in the early days of this area. Uh, There are a ton of German clubs throughout the state of Indiana, but in the basement of the downtown Indy Club is this marvelous, authentic German restaurant that Dad and I go to each year. Inside, there are carvings of Faust and Mephisto uh, and quotes from the original work over this antique fireplace mantle. It's all in German, and it's been since high school so, so, so many years ago that I read and translated German, so I have no real idea what it is saying. Uh, But it's wonderful art and interesting expressionist depictions of these main characters. 
Now, Faust was originally written by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Now, in the early 19th century is when this was released. It's written in a sort of classic uh, tragedy style and presented in two parts. The first part was released in 1808, and the second in 1831 after Goethe had passed away. However, Faust was not something that Goethe just whipped up in the opening years of the 1800s. He'd actually been kicking the story around for at least 30 years before it finally got made. This is Goethe's lasting legacy and considered his masterpiece of literature. However, uh, while he was absolutely considered to be in the same league as Shakespeare in England, Dante in Italy, and even Homer from ancient Greece, Goethe uh, also dabbled in a lot of other things. Uh, he went to law school, and after graduating law school, he served as a judge who basically helped settle cases between the various German states in the Holy Roman Empire. He'd write his first bestseller during the time. It was a romance novel based on a deep infatuation he had with a friend's fiance. Uh, but it has a terribly sad ending and basically serves as an examination of how romance and love is greatly desired, but it can cause all sorts of problems and despair as well. And it was a huge success. And this book, The Sorrows of Young Werther, uh, was even supposedly a favorite of Napoleon's. However, he ended up working as an advisor and civil servant in Weimar for most of his life. And he used that to actually create a more artistic society in Weimar. Um, he helped build a, a playhouse. He, he helped build a, uh, a green space, a, uh, like a big park inside a city. But he also had other interests. He dabbled in science. Um, he was heavily into eroticism, despite having a realistic and kind of unpopular view on long-term relationships, and even had thoughts on religion that were admirable because he opposed the central teachings of Christian ideology and felt that it did not fit Christ the man at all. But Faust is Goethe's legacy through and through. From his teenage years to his 80s, Goethe basically dabbled away working on the two parts of Faust, and it was a culmination of all he thought about and experienced in his travels. It focused on the man Faust, who was incredibly smart. Uh, he had lots of interesting things to talk about and study, but he didn't really do much of anything and was really kind of weary of life itself. So Mephistopheles decides to offer him youth, ultimate knowledge, and virility. And it's said that the full two-part version of Faust is a 13-hour play. Very few people have ever seen the entirety of the play in one go. Due to all the things that uh, Goethe does and all the things that Faust tries, it's hard to think Faust wasn't somewhat drawing heavily from Goethe's own life and desires, if not straight autobiographical. So let's talk about Murnau's version itself. The movie opens with the gates of hell opening and three of the force horsemen uh, riding out to deliver war, plague, and famine onto the people of Earth. A holy war of words between the devil, who we find out is Mephisto, and an archangel takes place. The angel shows a man named Faust, who is teaching a class about how man's free will gives him uh, the choice between good and evil, heaven and hell, and it's kind of a miracle that they do have this, and they should be uh, taking that very seriously and almost religiously that, that God bestowed free will upon his his flock but the uh, Mephisto reveals that Faust does have greed by way of practicing alchemy to try to create gold and become rich Mephisto makes the wager that he can wrest Fa uh, Faust's soul from God and if he does so he shall inherit the earth so to kick things off, Mephisto delivers that plague to the town where Faust lives. Many die very quickly, and Faust labors hard and prays harder to find a cure. And he kind of thinks that maybe he might be onto something, and a girl comes to Faust to get his help with her dying mother. And when he is unable to help the woman, um, she ends up passing away, he gives up much of his pursuits in alchemy. Faust, completely broken by this terrible plague tells those begging for his help that neither belief nor knowledge can save them 
and that all is lost. Now, a religious tome that he is burning with his alchemy books flips open to a page about how he can seek help from the devil. Basically, go to a crossroads and call his name three times. He shall appear, and a bargain could be struck. He is soon met by various people, all with glowing eyes and almost seem less than human in looks. But these old people are just kind of a human projection of Mephisto himself. And Mephisto offers him a deal. Renounce God and all of his uh, angels and all of his teachings and everything about him. And he will give all the power and knowledge that Faust needs to save the village from the plague. Faust laments that if only he had the power for one day to help. And Mephisto likes this idea. Give this power he offers uh, a try for a single day. And if he opts not to continue with the contract, he may cancel at any time. It's like he's signing up for a streaming service. But this deal would allow for Mephisto to help the sick uh, and starving by way of giving Faust the knowledge he needs or the power he needs. So Faust signs the contract in blood. And with just a touch of his hand, Faust can heal the sick. And he's instantly worshipped as a miracle worker. There's a catch, though. He is unable to help those who carry the crucifix. And the town realizes that, hey, this guy can't look upon the cross. Uh, he's probably in league with the devil, and he is to be stoned. Faust even tries killing himself, but Mephisto is having none of that. He cannot es escape this pact. So... With that, also, the trial day is not quite over yet. So he comes up with another idea for Faust. Why not be youthful and virile again? And Mephisto asks why Faust would want to die if he's yet to live. And Faust admits that he hates life. He's too old to enjoy the pleasures. Uh, he's too disinterested in pursuing life when he'd rather be a hermit and study. However, Faust eventually relents and asks for his youth. And Mephisto gives him that youth and beauty and shows him a visage of a beautiful woman, almost like uh, Venus on the shell or whatever the, that artwork is called. But uh, Faust wants to be taken to the beautiful woman at once. And Mephisto takes him uh, on, uh, on his cloak, almost like a flying carpet, to a celebration in Italy where this woman is being married. And Mephisto uses a box that has this incredibly bright light that blinds everyone in the celebration and allows for Faust to run off with this beautiful woman who had just gotten married to some other poor chump. Now, once Faust wins the girl, well, his trial day has run out. And in order to keep his youth so he can keep making love to this woman, he shakes Mephisto's hand to serve him forever. Now, Faust grows tired of the constant living and that he's doing by continuously having sex with the most beautiful woman in Italy, he actually begins to yearn for home. And Mephisto takes him back there and seems kind of irritated that Faust is ha happy and playful and enjoying the scene of this Easter celebration. He sees a simple villager named Gretchen and she is excitedly going to church for Easter service and she's quite beautiful. And Mephisto warns Faust that she is not his type, but Faust follows her into the church where Mephisto cannot follow him. Despite Faust trying to uh, meet this girl, she runs away from him. So Faust has Mephisto charm the girl with a golden necklace. And to be honest with you, things get pretty dark from here. So, while Mephisto distracts Gretchen's aunt, Gretchen and Faust meet, but Mephisto has another plan in place. The two young lovers fall in love, and Faust goes to Gretchen that night to have a night of romance. Mephisto first um, fires up Gretchen's brother, Valentin, who is uh, in from vacation. I think he's a soldier. Um, and basically tells him that uh, he better hurry home because uh, Gretchen, who is supposedly the most beautiful girl in the village, is not very well behaved and he may want to go check this out. He also uh, stirs up a wind that blows into the house that 
causes Gretchen's mother to wake up and she catches the two lovers in Gretchen's room and dies on the spot from shock. When uh, Valentine gets there, he challenges Faust to a duel and they their sword fight kind of spills out onto the streets of the village and Mephisto steps in and stabs Valentine in the back. And then he tells Faust that he killed him and he should probably run away. And with his dying breath, as the villagers collect around him after Mephisto himself cries out murder throughout the streets to get the attention put on this, Valentin condemns Faust for his death and basically exclaims that his sister is a harlot. And in fact, the translation calls her a whore. And part of his last request is that she's put in the stocks for what's been done to him. Faust and Mephisto end up flee, fleeing on a demonic steed. But it gets worse. Gretchen has a kid by Faust. And because she has no family, no husband, no job, whatever, she's left homeless. And when winter comes, Gretchen tries to get help for her child from members of the village. But they deny her because... She was the one in the stocks after her brother was killed. She sees a vision of a warm cradle to put her baby in, but it's simply an illusion. The baby is left in the snow where it dies. She's found by the authorities and burned at the stake for murder. Faust realizes what's going on and tells Mephisto that uh, he wishes he never asked for his youth. And so therefore, Mephisto is glad to... Uh, give him back his old age and when he's reverted back to being an old man um, he basically tries to get to Gretchen to save her um, but he's a little too late the fire has already been started and he kind of leaps into it and begs for her forgiveness she recognizes him as his youthful self and the two are burned together and their spirits are reunited and claimed by the archangel who tells Mephisto that he's lost the wager because true love has won. So let's get to the three things I like about this movie. First up, I love the look of Mephisto and the Archangel. They're both these winged creatures and their wings are so intricate and just they look like what you would expect real angel wings to look like. They have feathers, they look like they're heavy. Um, of course, the Archangel has lightly colored curls and fair skin, um, but Mephisto is this dark character he has horns um but what's more is that he's also a furry beast um his hands have claws and he is like wearing the suit that really makes him look like a monster more so than a fallen angel then mephisto appears um at the village and spreads the plague and it's actually a really uh, spooky image uh, Mephisto just simply looks like a monster. Um, and Mephisto was played by Emil Jannings. Uh, Jannings, unfortunately, was one of the German actors and filmmakers who crossed over to the Nazi party once they took control and furthered his career in the various state-approved productions. But in this, he is fantastic. Um, and he's just hamming it up. It's, it's great. And, you know, and he is... The, the pure like emotion of this movie because he has everything to gain by corrupting Faust. So, you know, he's, he's a trickster. He's, um, he starts trouble. Uh, his face is, is doing so much acting and it's, um, it, it it's just, it's fantastic. It, it's hard to explain without you seeing it. Just take any single frame of Emil Jannings, especially in his human guys. And, you have something that that is a master class in how to act like a villain and like you're enjoying being the villain now when he takes on his human appearance especially after giving faust his youth he actually looks more like count chocula than anything else and it's pretty awesome um it's just it's it's a great design and great makeup on that character now, second, much like the other silent films we watched this month, this movie is quite lush and very well designed. There's this great shot 
of that celebration in Italy when uh, Faust has been made young and he's going to be taken to the most beautiful woman in Italy by uh, Mephisto. And as they're kind of arriving, the camera is panning down what looks like several stories to see the various party goers in this lush, almost, um, it's not a castle, but it's almost like a this grand ball uh, room or this grand mansion where everything is taking place and people are paying their respects to this woman and and everything and and it's it just looks like a really complicated and sophisticated shot uh, for a film to make in the 20s uh, with the technology avail- available at the time. You know, these days we think about crane shots and how common they are. This would have probably been a relatively new thing as it's kind of panning down this very tall scene uh, is the best way that I can put it. Interiors seem large and full of depth and width allowing people to comfortably move about the scene. Uh, There are some really cool settings created, like when Faust is growing tired of uh, the debauchery and the constant passion, and it looks like he's sitting around in hell with like little volcanoes kind of spitting out smoke around him. Um, As he pines for a simpler life, he really does look like he's literally in hell. He's trapped in a constant cycle of what Mephisto granted him with his youth. Um, It's a great visual representation of what's going on with that character. Thirdly, this tale kind of takes you pretty much through all of the different emotions you can possibly have. You have Emil Jannings hamming it up as Mephisto. You have Faust just trying to get laid and experience life again. Um, Both of those things are in some ways kind of funny, or at least played very light. Um, There's this romance angle that seems innocent and good, but gets terribly dark almost right away. And it's a curious condensation of the original tale of Faust. Um, This also has a finality to it with the two lovers burning together and being saved at the end, as opposed to the first part of Faust originally just having uh, the girl burn and being told by the archangel that she will be saved. Um, and Faust goes on to live out part two. Uh, but this is a really dark romance. Faust, I wouldn't call him a very good guy. Um, I guess you can say that he's only a man and that he'll make bad decisions based solely on desire. But his desire to help the people of his village dying from the plague really ultimately not only gets himself, but his true love and her family killed. Uh, She is completely and totally wrecked by Faust's existence and pact that he made. I mean, Faust dies too, but it's such a weird ending to say that these two making their sacrifice saves the world from evil. But this isn't something that Gretchen signed up for. It's not afraid to basically make it so there is no happy ending, despite actually there being a, I guess, technical happy ending of the two lovers being saved. Um, and by their actual love and, and which itself makes you wonder if that's technically true. If Mephisto gave Faust the looks to obtain youthful, playful love, and there's a charm more or less put to Gretchen to kind of open her up to Faust's attentions. Ah, well, uh, I guess my point is that this movie really makes you think about what its final conclusion is and the steps taken to get there. I will say one other kind of interesting thing. Most of these movies that we're watch that, that we talked about this month are all considered to be classics of cinema. Interestingly, uh, at the time that these were released, these movies weren't exceptionally well received. Um, in particular, Faust was a financial flop and um, there was some critics that disliked the changes to the story and uh, some of the performances as well. However, nowadays, this is considered one of the seven examples of German expressionist cinema. And uh, it's considered to be an important piece of the German cinema of the time. Um, and another one of those that belongs to Murnau is coming up next week. So, um, we'll, we'll talk about that there in just a second, but this wraps up this week's, 
uh, Monster Mondays. If you uh, want, you can catch new episodes of Monster Mondays each Monday at FilmSeizure.com. You don't forget to follow Film Seizure at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and subscribe to Film Seizure to get both the Wednesday Film Seizure podcast and Monster Mondays at your favorite podcast providers, as well as YouTube. You can also check out my website, bmovieanima.com, to read new articles every Friday morning. So let's talk about what's coming up next time. It's the 200th episode of Monster Mondays, and we're sticking with Murnau, and uh, it's time to talk about his masterpiece in horror, Nosferatu. So until next week, stay spooky. <laughs>